So you think that the martial arts are just about self-defense? Well, stay tuned to find out what's really behind the martial arts and Eastern mysticism. My name is Yvonne Lewis. And I'm Jason Bradley, and you're watching Urban Report. Urban Report. Our guest today is Eric Wilson, former instructor in the martial arts of Qigong, Bagua Zhang, and Tai Chi Chuan. Jason is with me, yay! And we are going to explore the martial arts and the force behind it. Welcome to Urban Report, Eric. It's a pleasure to meet you. Before we start, we have a little clip that just kind of sets this whole thing up, and I, I want to air that clip. Let's take a look. powerful yeah what what got you involved in the martial arts well before we even go there let's talk about where you were born how you were raised all of that and and find out about your journey so where were you born and and where did you grow up I was born in Orlando Florida uh, my, both my parents were Seventh-day Adventist Christians so I was raised in a Christian home um, when I was probably five years old, we moved up north to Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina. I spent most of my life in that area on the East Coast. And were you an only child, or did you have siblings? No, I have a brother seven years younger than me. Uh, we're very close, so uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and so you, you were raised by Seventh-day Adventist parents, and so you grew up in a two-parent household. Yes, ma'am. And then did it remain that way or was there a big change? What happened in your life? When I was 12 years old, my parents went through a separation and, the, and a divorce. Uh, you know, the enemy came into our home like he does in so many homes and causes conflict and we don't even realize often that the conflict is with him, not with one another. Mm -hmm. So my parents were divorced you know, when I was 12. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel when they got divorced? It created, uh, it created doubt, it created insecurity, it created a feeling of rejection. Um, as a young man especially, and I know it's this way for, for young women as well, but for a young man especially, 
a father figure, having a father, a dad in a home is what gives you and assures you of your purpose in life. Mm -hmm. God has called all of us as sons and daughters of God and it's through our father and our mother that we are, are assured of that, that we're given our role. And so when my mom and dad were divorced and my dad had to move away, I lost that. You know, and I was searching desperately for what is my purpose in life? You know, what is my reason for being here? And a lot of times, um, young people, when they're searching for that, they'll look for a role model. And it, it may be in, in Hollywood, or it may be in sports, or it may be in the fashion industry, but they're looking for someone to look up to to assure them of, of who they are and their identity. So for me, when I saw the men that practiced in the martial arts, I saw what I was missing. I saw men that appeared to be fearless. So they, they appeared to be in control of every facet of their lives. Mm -hmm. Nothing took them by surprise or caught them off guard. And I thought, you know, that's what I want. I want that kind of confidence. I want that assurance in my life. And I didn't realize that that assurance comes from knowing who we are in Christ. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you, you at, by the age of 14, you were kind of searching for that mentor, that role model, yes. that whole thing. And in school, I guess in, at that time too, you know, you go through like, you could be bullied or there can be, is, was that your, your situation as well? Yes. I'll, men are, are trying to prove themselves, mm. <laughs> especially young men. So I had a number of men that, young men that were, you know, trying to prove themselves and use me as their, as their guinea pig. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I told my mom, I said, I really want to get started in martial arts. And at first my mom was very against it and she couldn't explain why, but she just felt in her heart that something just was not right about it. And uh, anyway, I, I found out about a school that was a quote, Christian martial arts school. A Christian martial arts school. I've never heard of such Sounds a like thing. Sounds like an oxymoron. Well, <laughs> and like back when I started, you know, 1983, 1984, it was unheard of almost. Now they're everywhere. Christian you know, martial arts schools. Yes, Christian what, yoga, Christian Tai Chi. I mean, it's everywhere. What differentiates them from mainstream martial arts? What, what do they do that differs? They say the word Jesus. That's about it. Um, <laughs> And I, I don't mean that derogatory, uh -huh. but oftentimes, you know, it's, it's sort of like music. Well, it's Christian rock. Well, what's the mm -hmm. difference between Christian rock and regular rock? Mm -hmm. Well, the words. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to do a yoga pose. I'm going to meditate, but I'm going to meditate and I'm going to use Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. um, so the school, I know that the intent was good. You know, they read Bible verses. You know, you know there were some changes made in people's lives. But what was hard was is that Jesus says, if someone strikes you on one side of your face, turn the cheek. The martial arts says, if someone swings at you, block and counter. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's an opposition in the teaching. One is completely against what the other, the spirit is completely different. Mm -hmm. One is a spirit of pride and the other is a spirit of humility. Well, and I'm going to explore that a little bit more, but let's go back for a second. When you walked into that dojo for the first time, what did you, th well, explain what a dojo is, first of all, because our viewers, some viewers might not know that, and then explain how you felt when you walked into the dojo. The first place that my mother took me, um, it was a, a Japanese school, which is a dojo. It's a Japanese word, and it, it means to us in, in America, in, in the English language, it means a training hall. Mm -hmm. But if you look the word up in the Japanese, it actually has a much uh, deeper meaning. It means up the place of enlightenment. Mm. Uh, the Chinese word for that is a daozheng, it, it, and it has the same meaning, a place of enlightenment. Uh, in the Hindu religion, it would be a place of nirvana. Interesting, isn't it interesting how here in this country, we have taken in certain practices thinking that they are harmless, thinking that they are just, you know, self-defense or whatever, but it's, it's more than what we know. Mm -hmm. yes. It's more than what we know. Well, you always have those things where they look great on the surface, but as you dig deeper, you un unveil or uh, uncover 
uh, the the truth and the meaning behind it. I mean, it, it's even if if you look at today with uh, all this togetherness and stuff like that, how people want to all come together mm. in terms of religion and, and things of that nature. What happens is people are going to end up compromising uh, morals and beliefs mm. and, and coming together, which sounds great on the surface, but what are you giving up? Are you, are you giving up God's law to follow man's law and man's ideal or, you know, just to come together? Or, right, or right, right. I remember with you, Jay, I put you into karate and without knowing, I was, you know, I was thinking, Eric, as you were talking about, your mother was a bit reticent about taking you to, uh, to learn about, you know, self-defense and stuff. Well, with Jay, I wanted to put him in there because I wanted to make sure that if anybody was trying to fight him or something, he would know how yes. to defend himself. And t well, Jay, you tell what happened with you when I put you in and took you out. Well, okay, so <laughs> she put me into karate, and um, I went, and I was excited about it, but then I noticed they had this statue in the, in the front, and they want mm -hmm. you to bow to Buddha, and then, you know, you're bowing to each other, and it's a lot of bowing going on. <laughs> And my mom, when she saw that, she was like, no, you're not bowing to anything, you know, and she, she ended up pulling me out not too long after <laughs> well, that. Well, yeah, he never went back. <laughs> Praise yeah. the Lord. Because I didn't, when I walked in, I hadn't walked in before. I would just drop him off and pick him up. But I walked in this time with him, and I saw everybody was bowing to a statue. And I, I thought, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 my son's not going to do that. Was that your experience when you walked into that first training center, dojo, for the first time? Did they have you bow, bow to each other, bow to the statue? What, what did you do when you walked in? The first time that I went, we were just there visiting, so we didn't have to go through, you know, that part of the ritual. Um, but if someone signs up, it, it's very common, even here in the States, if it's a traditional school, you remove your shoes when you step into the school or onto the mat, you bow to the instructor, you bow towards the showman or the front of the, the dojo or the studio. Um, and that was one of the things that really I found after years of being in the martial arts was it made me compromise what God's Word said. God's Word says, you know, I am the Lord your God, you know, thou shalt not bow down or serve anyone above me. Right. Um, but yet the martial arts says it doesn't really mean that. I know it's what it says, but that's not what it really means. Hmm. Um, the martial arts says when you reach a certain level of achievement that you are called a sifu or a sensei, which means a master. Jesus said, don't call any man master. You have one master, even me. Again, there's a compromise. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I learned later on, you know, when I, when I stepped onto that training floor, almost, almost every martial arts studio that's a traditional studio, you have to remove your shoes. Mm -hmm. And I remembered, you know, when I was at church reading about Moses when he appeared before the Lord at the burning bush and, mm -hmm. and God told him, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but I did all these things and it was like small steps. You know, you take one step and compromise and That's it's right. easier to take the next one. And then you take another and then you take another and pretty soon you're so far down the path you can't find your way back out, nor do you even realize that you're in the wrong. That's right. So That's it, right. It, was, it was that way. It was very gradual and I didn't realize where it was leading me. How long did you study? Um, I was in it right at 25 years. And how far did you go? The, the highest rank that I was awarded was a fifth dawn um, in Chinese Kung Fu. Uh, and then I, I had seven black belts in, in combative styles. And then I also had instructor certification in internal arts and Chinese medicine. Explain that system to us. So you said a fifth dawn. What is a fifth dawn and what are the different levels? Okay, and these vary depending on whether it's a Japanese style or whether it's a Chinese style. Um, but as a, a general rule, a first dawn is a first level black belt. It means you just got your black belt. And the masters will tell you that means you've mastered the basics. Mm -hmm. It means you just got out of you know the beginning. You know the basics. And then for people that want to go past that, 
they'll normally strive to become what's known as a, a sifu in Chinese or a sensei, which is an instructor. Some schools, I mean, you have to be a second dan or a third dan. Other schools, I mean, you can be promoted to that right off the bat if the, if the other instructor knows you're ready. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the dan or dawn ranks, they normally have, most schools will have first through tenth dawn. So you make black belt, and that's considered first dawn, and then there's a second dawn, a third dawn, a fourth dawn. And to reach the level of a master, typically, is a sixth dawn. Normally, it's the number six that they consider to be a master, which I find interesting. That because, is interesting. Mm -hmm. Because six is the number of man. Right. Um, and I know the, the last grandmaster that I trained under, you know, he explained to me one time, he said, Eric, he said, for someone to achieve that rank, to be recognized in traditional Kung Fu, which was my primary style back then, for someone to achieve a sixth dawn, there has to be a surrender to those powers. There has to be a surrender. He said, you can have technique, he said, but it's not technique that makes a master. There's something spiritual that has to be imparted to you. Isn't that fascinating? You see, if you're at this level, you don't know about the spiritual dimension. You don't know right. that that there's something else going on underneath it. Right. It's as you continue actually to get deeper and deeper into it that you learn that there's something else going on here. It's not just self-defense. It's a spiritual level too. Let's unpack that a little bit more, Eric, because um, you bring out some things in, in your documentary that we are going to air by the grace of God on Dare to Dream. We're going to show that uh, clip of it later. You bring out some things in there about the Tao and about the circle. I found that to be fascinating. Let's talk a little bit more about the spiritualistic aspects of, of the martial arts. One of the one of the first things that I remember when I was training, um, like as a white belt, as a beginner in the studio that I started in, I would watch some of the men that had you know, green belts or brown belts that had been there for you know three years or five years or eight years or 10 years. And I would watch them when they would fight or when they would kick the bag or when they would do certain you know, drills. And you could see the power that was there and then I would watch the Grand Master, and I'll never forget something. I remember one time when he was talking to a group of the, the higher level students, and he was talking to them about this, this energy that is known as chi, mm -hmm. or in the Japanese they call it ki, like in Aikido. Mm. He was talking about this energy that martial artists strove to, to access, to tap into. And he said, he said, when you grab a hold of your opponent, he said, it's not just physical muscle. You, you can't just physically do things because that'll only go so far. I mean, I can run my whole life and I'm never gonna be able to run 70 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because I'm not built to do that. Mm -hmm. with, a, with a human being, the human fist is not physically built mm -hmm. to do things that you see a lot of martial artists mm -hmm. capable of doing. And when he was demonstrating this to them, I remember we had a, a training bag. It was like a 150 pound training bag. And it's hanging, you know, and he reached over and he grabbed that with one hand and he picked it up and he shook it with one hand. And it was like, you, all of us were just dumbstruck. You know, how did he pick that up with one hand like mm -hmm. it was a featherweight? Wow. And then he said, that's what you've got to know how to tap into. That's what, so th this, this carrot was constantly dangled in front of the, the students that had been initiated, the ones that had been there for a few years. Mm -hmm. There's always that carrot. And they say, if you want more, you've just got to take another step, mm -hmm. another compromise. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. You don't have a sense of, when you first get into it, you have no idea how far are you gonna drift? Because Satan is very crafty. He just takes you just a little step at a time. A little step at a time. Were you gonna say yeah. something, Jim? Yeah, we talked uh, prior to this program and you were, you were talking about chi and, and when you get to a certain level, how you're teaching different levels, different things about chi. Will you, will you touch on that? 
What is your definition of chi? Let me give you the definition that I was given by one of the grandmasters I trained under. I went to see him to, to learn from him that weekend, and he only taught black belts. You, had, you could come to him from any style, any style, it didn't matter, and say, I want to learn, and he would take you and, and begin training you. Even if he had never been in that style, he could teach you how to make your style better, mm. how to make your abilities better. And I asked him one time, I said, you know, how do you, how do you know what this person knows? How do you help them? And he said, he said, Eric, he said, all martial arts find their roots at the Shaolin Temple. And he said, what was it that Shaolin Temple taught? He said, if you see Taekwondo and you see Tai Chi and you see, you know, yoga and you see all Taoist exercises and you see, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Aikido, if all of them find their roots at the Shaolin Temple, he said, what was it that they taught? Because all of these look like they're so different from one another. And I didn't know the answer, but I was very intrigued. I wanted to know, what is the common thread that's woven throughout all of these different arts? And I'll, I'll never forget, he drew a diagram and he showed all these arts, almost like a, a family tree. He showed all of these paths, how they all went back to Shaolin. And then at Shaolin, he took the, the marker and he put a big E and he circled it. He said, that's what they taught, energy, chi. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's what they want to share with the world. He said, now when a beginner comes to me, he said, you teach a beginner that chi is this internal strength that's already inside you. You just have to learn how to tap into it and use it. And they do that with yoga, they do it with Tai Chi, they do it with Aikido, meditation, whatever. Doesn't matter what you call it. He says, now for an intermediate student, we tell them that Chi is breath. That's why you do the deep breathing exercises. That's why the meditation and, and the, the chanting, um, the mantras. He said, now for the advanced student, he said, for someone that's past black belt, he said, you reveal to them what chi really is. Chi is spirit. Mm -hmm. And when he said that to me, you know, alarm bells were going off. But unfortunately, I mean, I, I turned my ear. I didn't want to hear what God was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it wasn't long after that that I went to visit him for some one-on-one -on -one training. And uh, I'll never forget this when this happened. I was there in the in the studio, in the martial arts studio, and he and I were talking, and one of the young black belts, a younger man, came in, and he was carrying this big piece of artwork that was covered in brown paper, you know, and wrapped, you know, with string. And the Grand Master was really excited, and, and I don't call him that, I gotta be careful, I don't call him that because that's what I think of him. Right. He's just a man, but right. I, I'm given a reference. Right, mm -hmm. right. But this Grand Master, he was so excited about receiving this, this artwork, and so he took the paper off of it and he put this out there, and it's just this really beautiful piece of Chinese calligraphy. And you know, you look at it, and I knew what some of the Chinese symbols were in calligraphy, but not all, I, I couldn't read Chinese. And so the young black belt left, and we were there alone in the studio. And I asked the grandmaster, I said, what does it mean? And he got this look on his face, and I could tell that the enemy, the dragon, was, was influencing him how to word it. Mm -hmm. And he said, what it means in English is, it's the devil that's in the details. Wow. And when he said that, wow. I, I, did, I, mean, I didn't know what to say because there was no getting around that. And it was like the Lord was, in his mercy, he was trying desperately to set me free. And uh, in my mind, what I said was, okay, he may believe that, but I don't have to go that far. You know, I'm not going to... It doesn't mean that to me, you know. Mm -hmm. When we meditate, I know what she's meditating to, but I'm, not, I'm meditating to Jesus. That's what I did. Eric, I did almost the same thing because I, uh, a lot of you know my journey with Eastern medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and I did a lot of the same thing. Once you've gotten to a certain place 
and you start finding out a little bit more and a little bit more, you have one or two choices to make. You either say, oh, I'm way, I'm out too far, or you say, I don't embrace that. Mm -hmm. This is where I am. I am a Christian. I'm not into that Eastern thing, so I'm going to just put that aside. So I know exactly what you're saying, that you, you reach that point and it really the Lord was, he was reaching out to you. I mean, I almost got tears in my eyes as you were talking because I know he was trying to get your attention Amen. and show you where you were. But by this point, you were so enmeshed in it that you made rationalizations for it. Yes. So how did these little compromises and rationalizations, how did that affect your family? By this time, I would imagine that you have a family, you're married. How did your studying the martial arts affect your family? Probably the greatest way that I noticed for myself that the training in the martial arts, and it wasn't just martial arts, but it was also some of the other arts that I had begun learning, you know, the internal arts like Tai Chi or Bakwa or Qigong, the focus was inward. So, you know, somebody that practices Tai Chi, you're always taught in that class, how do you feel? Mm. You know, so instead of it being faith in God's Word, it's feeling. In yoga, your focus is inward. How does this make you feel? Are you breathing right? Are you feeling that in the right place? Well, looking inward, the focus is on self. In the martial arts, the focus is on self. If you open any yellow page ad anywhere in the country, you'll see one main description, self, self-esteem, self-discipline, self-control, self-defense. Mm. Everything's focus is on self rather than on others. Mm. Um, so what happened was, is I started noticing in my family, in my marriage, that my focus was on self. It was on me rather than on how can I please my wife? How can, how can I sacrifice myself on behalf of my family, my wife, my children, others? My focus was on me. I want to take care of me. Hmm. And that developed kind of in, kind of correlated with your, the, the deeper you got into the martial arts, the more into self you became? Yes, yes. And, uh, and that's amazing too because like there's a lot of the yoga uh, websites now. When you look, they'll have uh, a picture of the Buddha and they'll have a picture, you know, and they'll say yoga is the study of self. It's the realization of the greater self within. And you think, wow, I mean, has the Lord not warned us of this? And you know, yoga is creeping into churches and schools and there's just this big push. I'm working now on my second little booklet. My first one was what's wrong with acupuncture because uh, I was involved in that for years. And now I'm working on one, what's wrong with yoga. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, because, because people think that it's harmless. It's just some stretching and breathing, mm -hmm. and it's not. What do you say is wrong with yoga? The, the part that is the most, um, the thing that should give us the most clear warning is what the word yoga literally means. Mm -hmm. When you look the word yoga up in Hindu, Sanskrit. If you go to any Hindu dictionary or any yoga website, they are open about what yoga is. The word yoga literally means to yoke to or be joined to Brahma, which is another name for the Hindu gods collectively. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a counterfeit. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. But these pagan disciplines are saying, become yoked to Brahma, become yoked or joined to these Hindu gods. So that, that's the first clue that it's not a good thing. Absolutely. It's interesting because all of these things are the opposite of Christianity. Like you were saying, a lot of self, 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 and then feelings. We're taught to operate off principles, not feelings. Amen. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. And then it's interesting that it's the whole thing is, seems like, uh, in terms of martial arts, that it's based off 
deception, right? So you are supposed to teach a certain thing to different levels. Mm -hmm. So you tell them that, okay, this chi is just energy, it's just a life force. Then it becomes breathing. Then, you know, later, what was the third thing? Then uh, it becomes spirit. Then it becomes spirit. So then you really find out <laughs> once you've already got deep enough. Um, so I, I, I find that to be uh, very interesting, almost like going back to the garden. It is, and it, it's funny that you use that analogy because when you look at what they teach in any of these Eastern mystical arts, I was asked one time, you know, what is it, if you could sum up in one sentence, what's the danger of any of these Eastern practices? It, it's one thing. It undermines faith in God's Word. Mm. And let me share, you just said it. Mm -hmm. They put feeling instead of faith in God's Word, instead of principle. This is what God says. I'm going to walk forward because He said this. He's promised this. But do I feel that way? So you're taught to rely on how you feel rather than what you know to be right from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And in my life, um, in the martial arts as well as the other arts, traditional Chinese medicine or the Qigong or whatever, that principle was the same. That was what was compromised. So as I began to, to yield to what these Eastern arts were telling me to do, taking my shoes off, bowing, calling a man Sifu or master or grandmaster when God's Word says don't do that, it got easier to compromise. And when the enemy came into my wife and I's life as he attacked so many marriages, God's Word says this is how you do it. I hate divorce. I have no, no will that anyone ever goes through that because I know the damage it does. And then I'm, I'm used to looking inwardly, how does this make me feel? You know, well, I don't care if that's what God's Word says. Maybe He didn't even really mean that. I, I can remember when, when the devil first brought the thought to my mind about this is not going to work. You all just need to split up. You weren't made for one another. It's like I went through the scriptures for months looking up every single word that I could find, every promise, every command by God that had to do with marriage. And it's like I couldn't find anything to give me an out. Hmm. And it's not that I wanted to get divorced, but it was like I had been taught for all those years to, t to fight physically. Mm -hmm. Even though the Word of God says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not mm -hmm. fleshly. So when my marriage came under attack, instead of getting on my knees and, and using the sword of the Spirit, I was trying to do it in my own strength. And I failed miserably. And I felt like I couldn't achieve. I couldn't do the right thing. You know, I would say, I'm going to bite my tongue. I'm not going to say that. Next thing I knew, I'm opening my mouth and I'm saying something that, you know, I shouldn't say that hurt my wife. So it got to a point where I just said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't live this way anymore. And I, I walked away from my wife and, and my family. And, you know, I was hurting, but I hurt them so much greater. Mm -hmm. But all of that came about because of one simple thing not having faith that God will do exactly what He's promised. Hmm. So was your wife, um, when you were studying the martial arts and all that, was she noticing the changes in you over the years as a result of that? Or did she, did she ever connect the two things? She didn't when we were, when we were still together, because we, we wound up going through a separation and divorce. Um, she saw the changes, but she didn't realize that there were spiritual forces that were working to bring those changes about. Mm -hmm. Fallen angels, mm -hmm. I mean, demons, devils, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. They have an active role in so many people's lives. And she didn't realize that that's what was causing the conflict. You know, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against mm -hmm. principalities and powers. That's not just the people that are ruling the world. It's the people that are in our homes. Mm -hmm. so, and the demons. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we open the door for them to, there's right. certain things within our lives that open the door for them to That's come right. in. That's Absolutely. right. That's mm right. -hmm. So by my permission, they were entering into our lives. Right. And I'll give you an example. 
Um, the word martial art is the art of war. It literally means martial war, art, the art of war. And you think, is that what I want to teach my children? That's the fruit of what that training will do. They say it's self-discipline and self-control, but what you're actually going to have is you're going to have someone who's very proud, independent, unsubmissive, um, selfish, self-centered, controlling. Hmm. All of those fruits of warfare. In, in my wife and I's life, one of the things that, that first struck her it was right after we had separated. I don't know if we were divorced yet or not, but the Lord showed her something. She had a dream, and she said in this dream she saw the, the higher level people that were there at the school that I was training with, you know, the, the green belts, brown belts, black belts. And she said we were, we were linked arm in arm together. And she said she looked and she could see us, and then she said she saw on the outside the wives and the mothers and the children. And she said, we were getting closer and this, this circle was being pulled tighter and the families were being pushed to the outside. Mm. Um, and I remember her, her telling me that dream and I, I sort of just, I, I dismissed it. I didn't want to hear it when she told me. I wasn't, my eyes weren't open to, to hear or to mm. see. And, uh, but the Lord is very merciful. How did he get your attention? One night I was teaching a class. This was after my wife and I had been divorced you know, for some time. Um, I was teaching a class, and it was a, a, a Bagua class. And I was teaching a beginning level group, so we were going through the motions very slowly. It's similar to Tai Chi. Okay. And I was leading them in what's called a form or a kata. And I was leading this group of, of men and women, and we were walking slowly in this circle, and we were doing these certain mudras, these hand movements, and we were focusing internally on our breathing and focusing on moving this quote unquote, this energy through our body. Mm -hmm. And while we were doing this, I looked, and we're moving no faster than this. Everything that we were doing was slow motion. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing it, I looked in the eyes of you know those 12, 13, 14 people that were there, however many, and it's like they were in a trance. They were gone, hmm. and they were drenched in sweat. And a thought popped into my head. We have not done anything that is calisthenic. Hmm. Why are they sweating? I mean, phys physically, physiologically, that doesn't make sense. Why are they drenched in sweat, and, and we're moving this slow? And at that moment, I remember it was, I felt like I was taken above. Um, it was like I was looking down from 20 feet above where we were, and I could see what I was doing. I could see our students, and I saw a pattern. You know, it's like somebody, when a farmer goes out in this field and there's a crop circle, what does he see? It's a mess. Who did this to my corn? When the guy flies over that morning in the airplane, he's like, who did that design on the ground? Mm -hmm. He doesn't see a mess. He can see what it really is. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was allowing me to see from his perspective. And when, I, when the class was over, I went to a piece of paper and I drew what that looked like. And it was a circle with a dot in the center, a focal point or a bullseye. And all of a sudden it was like there was a flash in my mind of that picture that, it's called an inso, that picture of that circle with that dot in the middle through all the literature, all the books that I had. Didn't matter if they were Chinese or Japanese or Hindu, Aikido, Kung Fu, Shaolin, uh, even Filipino. I, could, I remembered seeing that in the books in my library. And that night I went home to my apartment and I started pulling those books out, looking for that symbol. And after I found it in so many different places, and I went online and looked, and I, I saw what that symbol really meant. And I began, the Lord began to cause me to understand the powers that were behind what I was practicing. Mm. And I thought, you know, how do I tell my students this? I mean, they're going to resist. You tell somebody a new truth and the wall goes up. What did the symbol mean? 
I'll tell you in a second. Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. I got to tell you how. Okay, okay, go ahead. Um, so I went to my, my advanced class the next week. We had a special group of people that met on a, a certain night, 10 o'clock at night after all the other classes were done, and we had a closed door class where I taught them about the secret stuff in martial arts, you know, chi and energy. And um, I told them, I said, I have homework for you. I said, I want you, and I drew that symbol on the, on the board. I said, I want you to find out what the symbol means. I said, I don't care where you look. You can look in Babylonian, Egyptian hieroglyphs. You can look in witchcraft. You can look in tattoo books. You can look in martial art. I said, I don't care where you find that symbol. Find that symbol and find the meaning for me. And the symbol is a circle a within circle, a circle. It's a circle with a dot in the center. A circle with a dot and in it the can center. It can be done matter the size of the dot. It's just right. the circle within a circle. Right. And uh, anyway, so I left them with that. Didn't make a big issue out of it. Well, they all came back the next week for that class, and it, you could have heard a pin drop when I walked in. Nobody was talking. Everybody was just silent. Mm. And I asked them, I said, okay, I said, who wants to go first? And one by one, they began to get up and share what they found and what their sources were. And they were from all kinds of sources. But all of them had the same answer. All of these high-level students had the same answer. The symbol is the symbol for the sun god. <laughs> it was the original symbol of the yin and yang. You know, we see a yin and yang which is part white, part black, mm -hmm. a little bit of white in the dark place and a little bit of black in the light place. That a symbol originally was just a circle. And then the Taoists said, it's really a circle with a dot in the center. And then they said, no, it's really a symbol with a yin and yang. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing that change one more time to where it's actually three. Uh, it's a, div a division into three spheres. Wow. Um, but they all found it. So I didn't have to tell them mm -hmm. what I had found. They found it. Mm -hmm. The sun god. I hope, that, I hope that our viewers are picking up on what this really is. This is not... It, again, there are surface things, and then there are latent, mm -hmm. occult, mm -hmm. hidden things. And, and the Lord would have us to know what is really behind this Eastern mysticism. Mm -hmm. Remember in the Bible how people were worshiping the sun? God hated that. And now it's all through the martial arts, mm -hmm. the yin and the yang, you know, the whole concept of, of blending. Light with darkness. Light with darkness, good and evil. It's like God never called us to blend. We're to eschew evil. Amen. But God, but, but God would have us to know that this is what's going on out there so that we can be equipped. We can Amen. be equipped and well furnished. Now, what about if you, is, is there any way to separate, let's say you want to learn self-defense techniques, like how, how can you separate or can you even separate the spiritual component from the actual physical uh, part? That's a good question because we have a lot of Christians, especially men mm -hmm. that ask that because you know, as a man, we are to protect our families. Mm -hmm. We are to, uh, to protect the helpless. What I have found, and I encourage every man and woman that's listening, you know, seek the Lord personally for the answer to this question. I'm going to share with you what the Lord has shown me. The idea, let's take for example of our military. Right now our military is being trained in a lot of the different Eastern arts. Mm. Um, our police officers are being trained mm. heavily in the, the Chinese and the Japanese and the Filipino martial arts. Um, we did not see military or law enforcement using these arts until after World War II when our troops came home from Asia, hmm. from Okinawa. When, when our troops went to Okinawa, they saw these little masters, you know, some of them only four foot eight, five foot tall, that could do seemingly miraculous things. And they were enthralled and they came back and they brought that with them. And then the Orient began to send more masters over here to introduce, you know, these Eastern techniques. Because with the Eastern techniques comes the Eastern philosophy, right. yin and yang. 
every art, no matter whether it's Chinese medicine or yoga or Tai Chi or Reiki or Kung Fu, it doesn't matter. Every one of those arts, their philosophy is based on yin and yang, wow. the blending of light and darkness. Mm -hmm. Now with self-defense, um, and I'll give you an example. I cannot find the phrase self-defense anywhere in scripture. I can find, <laughs> I can find hundreds of places where it says the Lord is my defense. And I'll, I'll share with you why I respond with that. I remember one day when my stepfather, he is a, a God-fearing man, he came to visit with my mom and my family had left and he and I were there alone and he came into the office and he said, uh, he said, Eric, he said, let me ask you a question now that your wife's not here. He said, now I know you got out of the martial arts. He said, I know God you know, called you out of that. He said, he said, but if someone broke into your house tonight and they were gonna hurt your wife and children, he said, you'd use those martial arts techniques to defend your family, wouldn't you? And the moment he started the question, I knew where it was going. Mm -hmm. And I was praying. I was like, Lord, I need an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, not my answer. I need your answer. What is your answer? Mm -hmm. And the Lord gave me that answer. And I told him, I said, I said, Wayne, I said, I know you're a man of God. and I know you believe the Bible, don't you? And he said, yes. And I said, right here in Psalm 34, verse 7 and 8, there's a promise that's given to us. The Lord says, the angel of the Lord mm -hmm. encamps round about them that fear him and, and delivers them. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, taste and see that the, that the Lord, Lord is good. Is good. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I said, I'm not saying that God is going to condemn someone who uses a gun or that uses a baseball bat or uses pepper spray. That's not what I'm saying. I said, but what I've decided in my life is I want to walk on a path of faith. I want to walk as I see Peter and James and John and Paul. And I can't find one account of them ever having to defend themselves hmm. in the New Testament. Now. I did have someone bring up to me one time the question of the Old Testament. Well, God sent the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. He said, wipe out man, woman, and child. And what about that? And I was like, okay, that's a good question, Lord. You know, what's your answer to that? Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine at Little Light Studios just happened to have that answer. And he called me one day and he shared it with me. He said, Eric, did you ever notice that when the children of Israel were sent into the land of Canaan, what the Lord told them? I said, well, I mean, no, I didn't. He said, it actually says you won't have to fight because I'm going to send the hornets and the bees in in front of you and they will drive out the inhabitants of the land. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They didn't trust God to do what he said he would do. So God said, okay, if you're going to have to go to plan B, then I'll, I'll help you. But I wanted plan A. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to self-defense, when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, He's not talking about somebody that's trying to murder you or your family. He's talking about you and I have an issue or you and some man has an issue mm -hmm. and there's pride involved and I'm trying to show you up or you're trying to show me up. Jesus was like, take the blow. I mean, it's not going to kill you. Get knocked down. It's not going to kill you. Um, so that's what that means when it talks about turn the other cheek. You know, defending your family, I encourage each of us because of the days we're living in, to learn how to take hold of his promises and not let go mm. because he cannot lie. So if someone is, because this question had crossed my mind earlier, if after 24, 25 years of practicing that, if someone approached you from the back and just grabbed you, would you just instinctively go into a defensive mode just because that's kind of, that was where you were? Do you kind of instinctively respond to that or because you might not even have a chance to cognitively go there. I'm just, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, like a reflex. Like, like a reflex. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the grandmasters I trained with, there were two. The first one, he told me something. He said, Eric, he said, you never want there to be thought in a fight. He said, if you think while you're fighting, you've already lost. Hmm. We were taught in the Chinese system, in Kung Fu, you've got to become the animal. Mm -hmm. If you're a tiger stylist, 
you have to become, you have to allow that spirit of the tiger mm -hmm. to take possession of you. And, and <laughs> they word it really, you know, in a, a nice way, you know, mm -hmm. you want to become like that tiger. And that inspires you with, wow, they're ferocious and they're brave. And they let that go for a while. But after you get past black belt or right at, they tell you, you have to become it. You don't pretend anymore. We go through the motions, like in the Chinese system, you know, you would do motions like a tiger or a stance like a tiger. But we do that because you're going through those motions to make it easier to allow that spirit to come in. Mm. Wow. Um, so on a, on a self-defense, you know, viewpoint, when we look at that and you think, how do I defend myself against somebody? You know, are those reactions going to come back? Walking away from martial arts is not like walking away from, uh, okay, I'm not going to go clubbing anymore. I'm not going to listen to rock and roll music. Mm -hmm. There were spirits that had been there influencing my life for those 25 years. Those had to be cast out of my life. Mm -hmm. And when the Lord, you know, set me free from that, I remember I kept a, a couple of boxes that had rank and certificates and all these pictures and videos and books and all that junk. And one day the Lord spoke to me and he was like, how long are you going to keep that stuff? I said, well, I may need that Lord, you know, one day to show people. And God was like, burn it because you still haven't closed the door. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I photocopied everything that needed to be photocopied. Mm -hmm. And I went outside with my family and, and we, we lit a nice bonfire and, uh, and it was amazing because when we did this, I was burning the belts and burning certificates and certificates on parchment paper, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's just paper. You'd stick that green belt certificate in there and it was gone. Mm -hmm. And I put the first black belt certificate in there in Kung Fu and it took probably 10 or 15 minutes for that mm. one piece of paper to burn. Wow. It sat there in the middle of a bonfire that was, you know, four feet tall and it sizzled and smoked, but would not catch fire. Mm. And I, I, my son even noticed it. He was like, Dad, wh what's wrong with that? Why will it not burn? Mm. And same thing when I put that first black belt in there. I mean, it took forever for that thing to burn. And the other belts, it was like they were gone. Mm -hmm. But God told me, he said, Eric, he said, when you come out of it, are you willing for me to deliver you from all the gifts that you gained? Mm. And I remember the verse in the Bible, it says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Mm -hmm. Old things are passed away. Yeah. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. And I wrestled with that for a few days and I was like, I'm willing for you to take those gifts. I'm willing for you to take those memories and I, I forsook them. Wow. And so now if somebody comes up and they grab a hold of me, they're just grabbing a hold of just a nobody. I'm a wow. 47-year-old nobody. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. that's amazing. Your story is amazing. And we, we are planning to air. You have a, a documentary, really, a two-part series that we want to air on Dare to Dream. We want to show a clip from that in just a second. But your story is just amazing. And we thank you so much. Let's show that clip so that our viewers can see what's going to be on that. I remember my first introduction to the martial arts. I was only about four or five years old as I watched in amazement as a little oriental man performed seemingly impossible feats of skill and power. A seed was planted that day, a seed which grew silently within my heart for the next 10 years of my young life. I never forgot the exhibition that I had seen that day, and I dreamed of the possibility of doing those things which I had watched that little old Asian man demonstrate with such ease. But little did I realize the darkness into which this path I was now following would lead nor the lives that my decision that day would influence and forever change. Today, the martial arts are looked upon as sport, as self-defense, health and fitness, and often as a form of artistic expression. But is this the way it has always been? Who are these men and women who dedicate their lives to these arts and amaze onlookers with their incredible feats of almost superhuman strength and speed? 
How are these abilities attained? And from whence comes the philosophies and spiritual teachings which permeate these practices? Why do we see such a growing influence of Eastern philosophy and mystical practices within the Christian church over the last 10 years? Are these practices focused merely on athletic ability, or are they being used to prepare mankind for the coming of a world teacher and a thousand years of peace? Are these Eastern mystical arts based merely on human talent and ability, or is there something much darker and more elusive working behind the scenes? Wow, The Dragon Revealed. That's, it's an amazing documentary, and, and Eric and Little Light Studios have given us permission to share it with you. So check your listing, your schedule, to see when it's going to air, because we're going to air it on Sabbath afternoons. On Saturday, for those of you who don't know when the Sabbath is, the seventh day of the week, Saturday, we're going to start airing it on Sabbath. Saturday afternoon. So check your schedule to see um, when it's going to air. Mm -hmm. it's excellent. So Eric, what would you tell our viewers in one minute or so? Um, what would you tell the viewer who has been involved in the martial arts? How can they detach from it? What can they do to get away from it? Tell them, please look into that camera and talk to a viewer about their journey. What I would do for anyone that has had involvement in these arts, whether it be martial arts or Tai Chi or yoga, to seek from God's Word first the truth. Lord, does this line up with your Word? Once you've done that, all it takes is surrender. The moment that we go to Christ and we say, I'm so sorry what I did, I, I didn't know. This was ignorant. I didn't know when I was involved in it. Ask Him to forgive you. Tell him that you want to surrender and be completely his. And the moment that you do that, that moment, he will set you free. We so appreciate you and your ministry. Tell us, uh, give us your website so that people can find you. Our website is isaiahministries.wordpress.com. And uh, we'd be happy to answer questions or to also send help if someone would like help or prayer. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much it for being with us. It was a pleasure to us. meet you. What and you blessing. too, Jesse. You too. <laughs> Matthew 7, 17 to 20 says, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So we ask you today, what is the root of the tree that you are developing? Is it a corrupt tree or is it good fruit that's going to be born from a good root? Check and see what you're studying. Make sure that you're in the will of God. God has a plan for you. He's not going to let you down. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome, Mother. And thank you again, Eric. This was a blessing. Join us next time, because you know what? It just wouldn't be the same without you.